بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا immersed in desire 
those who reject God, those who reject guidance coming from the direction of the Divine. When they're immersed in desire and temptation, you will see them going to extreme lengths. There's no end in sight as far as how much they're going to indulge in their temptation. They will drink, they will do drugs, they will abuse their spouses and their children, they will engage in illicit acts, they will gamble, they will ransack the belongings of every member of their family, they will destroy their lives and the lives of the people around them because to them, they don't worship God, but instead they have another deity that they choose to worship, and that's their desire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this in the Quran. He says, have you not seen the ones who have this quality? Instead of worshiping God, they worship an idol. That idol is their own desire. And if you worship your desire, then there is nothing stopping you. That's why so many celebrities, the rich and famous, they end up either committing suicide, overdosing on drugs, doing things that you wouldn't expect them to do. Remember Robin Williams? Robin Williams was the king of comedy. Robin Williams stood at the helm of the world of comedy. And the world of comedy is one of the most lucrative, one of the most successful, one of the most fun dimensions of Hollywood. Hollywood is where the world gets most of its entertainment from. So think about this for a moment. The world's entertainment center is Hollywood. At the very top of that pyramid in Hollywood sits the world of comedy. The king of comedy is Robin Williams. He, you think, for someone who's brought smiles to billions of people across the globe, for someone who's made them happy and joyous, you'd think he would be happy too. And yet he takes his own life, which is just another sign that true life is one that has God at its center. Ya ayyuhalladheena O you who believe, answer the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasul, answer the call of his messenger. You want true life? Then answer the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want true happiness? Follow the example of Ali ibn Abi Talib, not that of Muawiyah. Who do you think was happier in his life? Muawiyah sitting in his blue palaces, indulging in every sin and every desire. Surrounded by his harem of women and men. Do you think he was happier than Ali ibn Abi Talib? Even while Ali broke his bread, which was so stiff, he had to break it on his knee. That's how hard it was. But who do you think was happier? Ali or Muhammad? Who do you think was more miserable? In this life, forget the hereafter. Forget the Akhra. You want true life? Follow Ali. Follow Fatima. Follow Hassan. Follow Hussein. Because this is life. Everything else is nothing but a facade. Everything else is nothing but a fake depiction of life. That's why they take their own lives. Committing suicide. So much for happiness. So much for joy. Now, so the best Blessing is to be guided. The worst curse is to be deviated and is to be confused. When you're confused and when someone worships their own desire as their idol, as their day, as their God, they're a loose cannon. When they indulge in desire, as I said, they know no limits. And when they decide to become religious, they say, Allah Akbar and slaughter within a children. They're exactly the same, by the way. They're exactly the same. The fundamental common denominator between the first example and the second example, the ones who indulge in desire and the ones who kill in the name of God, is that they both worship their own desire. 
They both wake up every morning saying, what do I want to do? In the case of the former, it's to stimulate their senses and enjoy themselves for every passing moment of their days, right? Until they throw up. And the second, it's about fame, it's about power, it's about authority, it's about saying that I win and you lose. In both cases, the underlying disease is one and the same. Now, if you're going to take anything from these Majalis brothers and sisters, my dear friends, having come to gatherings in which Ali ibn Abi Talib is honored and commemorated, if you're going to take anything from these gatherings, let it be this, a stronger, more genuine love for Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because if you truly love Ali, you may slip here or there, but ultimately, that love, that attachment you have to Amir al-Mu'mineen will pull you back in. If you truly love Ali, then you will take him as your example. Every time you slip, every time you forget, every time you doze off and you forget what is truly important in life, you are reminded of a story of Amir al-Mu'mineen and that pulls you back towards him. The love of Ali, the true, genuine love of Amir al muminin is a good deed that no bad deed can ever ruin. Why? Because even if there is a bad deed here and there, and of course, sometimes we're subjected to our whims and our desires, the shaitan beautifies an act and we may slip up. It happens every once in a while. Right? But those bad deeds, they can never ruin that good deed, which is the love of Ali, because the love of Ali should pull you back if it's genuine, if it's true. If it's not just what we call laqlaqat lizam, if it isn't just something that we say and we roll off our tongues, but rather something we truly believe in. This is why it's important that even as kids, you teach your children, your brothers, your siblings, you teach them the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Allimu awladakum, the Messenger of Allah says, Hubba ahli bayti. Teach it to them. Don't just tell them to love the Ahli Bayt and expect them to do so. Educate them with the love of the Ahli Bayt. How? You tell them stories. You remind them every time they make a mistake. You tell them this isn't what Amir al Mu'mineen will do. This isn't what Imam al Hassan will do. This isn't what Imam al Jawad will do. This isn't what Ali al Akbar will do. You educate them. You teach them. You bring them up, having no heroes in their minds other than Ali and Al Ali. Forget these comics and superheroes that you see on television and on the movie screens. You want true heroes? The ziyara, there's a ziyara of Imam al-Husayn which we refer to him as such. Ya Batal al-Islam. Imam al-Husayn is the hero of Islam. You want true heroes? Look no further than the Ahlul Bayt. Look no further than Muhammad wa al Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The Holy Messenger of Allah is quoted as having said. Now, I want to mention the actual hadith to you. Beautiful hadith. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Man razaqahullah hubb al a'immati min ahli bayti. Anyone who has been blessed from Allah by having love towards the Imams from among my progeny, from among my household. If you love the Ahlul Bayt, this is what's going to happen. And by the way, Allah al Majlisi has an entire volume of his monumental work, Bihar al Anwar. This ocean of knowledge, this ocean of light and guidance, an entire volume is dedicated to the 
followers of the Ahlul Bayt and the consequences, the benefits of their love towards the Imams of this world as well as the next. Beautiful work, if you ever get a chance to research it. But this is one of those ahadith in which the Prophet lists 20 benefits for those who love Amir al Mu'mineen. Ten of them are in this world, the other ten are in the hereafter. So listen carefully. مَنْ وَزَقَهُ اللَّهُ حُبَّ الْأَعِمَّةِ مِنْ أَهْلِ بَيْتِهِ فَقَدْ They will get what the Prophet says خَيْرَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْأَخِرَةِ You will have the best of this world as well as the next. فَلَا يَشُكَّنَّ أَنَّهُ فِي الْجَنَّةِ Never doubt that when you have the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib in your heart you are in paradise right now. You are already in paradise. That's the difference between you and the one who doesn't recognize the Imam of his time. مَنْ مَعْتَ لَا يَعْرَفْ إِمَامَ زَمَانِهِ مَعْتَ مِيْتَةً جَاهِنِيَ أَيْ مِيْتَةَ كُفْرٍ وَنِفَاقٍ The ones who die without recognizing the Imam of their time, the leader, the divinely appointed leader of their time, they end up being like ISIS. مِيْتَةَ كُفْرٍ وَنِفَاقٍ A death of ignorance and disbelief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you have that love in your heart, you're already in Jannah, the Prophet says. Then the Prophet goes on to list the ten consequences of loving the Ahlulayt in this world and the ten consequences of loving them in the hereafter. I don't think we'll have time to talk about the second ten, but the first ten, inshallah, we'll talk about. The first, the Prophet says, as zuhd The first sign of someone who loves Ali ibn Abi Talib is that they will develop a lack of affinity towards the pleasures of this world. You will become an ascetic. You will have disregard towards the pleasures of this life. Why? Because we follow Ali ibn Abi Talib. The symbol of asceticism throughout history is not Buddha, it's Ali ibn Abi Talib. It's not Gandhi. It's Ali ibn Abi Talib. Why? Because unlike everybody else, Amir al Mu'mineen became the emperor, the undisputed leader of the greatest empire on earth at that time. A country spanning 50 of today's nations, as we've said before. And yet Imam Sadiq says, Have you ever seen a blessing that looks more like a curse? than Imam Ali's governorship of this empire? In other words, you think that when you become the leader of the greatest superpower on the face of the planet, then that would be a blessing, right? People congratulate you on that. People come up to you and say, well done, you've won, right? But to Ali, this was nothing but a curse. Why? Because being the emperor meant that Ali had to live at the same standard of living as the poorest person in the nation. That's why Amir al-Mu'mini only had bread, barley bread no less, not even bread that's made from wheat which is soft and white and beautiful. This is barley bread. We're talking about the kind of bread that is both not very tasty, and secondly, very, very rough, very tough, very strong. That's all he had, plus a little salt on the side. That was his side dish, that was his dessert. Salt. Because Amir al-Mu'mineen has to live at the same level as the poorest person. Imagine if we had someone remotely resembling Amir al-Mu'mineen in this day and age. You know, we live in a world where people now are talking about tyranny, oppression, about income inequality, about disparity between the richest and the poorest, about 100 people possessing 90% of the globe's entire wealth and resources, about the one percenters who earn more money in a day than a billion people earn in a year. This is the kind of world we're living in now. Right? Imagine if we had a leader that was the remote shadow of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Where upon becoming leader he says, 
I have to live like the poorest citizen, like the poorest subject of mine. This was Ali ibn Abi Talib. Not only this, Amir al mumineen when he was leader, he would walk into the treasury. The treasury was basically a very large room where money would be brought in from the farthest outskirts of the nation that the Imam ruled over. So they bring in what? It wasn't cash, it wasn't paper money, it was gold and it was silver, which was the prevailing currency of the day. So imagine you see, have you ever seen gold bars? You see gold bars in a movie and it gets your appetite going. You see its picture and you start drooling over it. That's how beautiful gold is. That's how attractive and shiny and glittery it is. So imagine now you walk in into the treasury of the Islamic government of Amir al a country spanning 50 of today's nations. How many gold bars there were, I don't know. How many gold coins, how many silver coins, I can't even begin to imagine. And yet Ali ibn Abi Talib would walk in and he say, he would say, Ya Safra wa Ya Bayra, O gold coins and O silver coins, Ghurri, Ghairi, find someone else to deceive. I am not going to be fooled by either of you. Someone came in and asked the Imam for help. So the Imam told Kamba, he said they had given him a thousand. Allah said to the Imam, yeah, I mean, could you be more specific? Are we talking a thousand gold coins or a thousand silver coins? The Imam said, Kila and Salah, to me they're both the same, give him whichever else and more. That's Ali's view of this world. I mentioned this the other night. The Imam likens authority and power over an entire empire in this life to the mucus that's excreted from the nostril of a goat when it sneezes. Afat Anz. Ali ibn Abi Talib would look at the money, all those gold bars, and he would say, Ya dunya, talaqtuki talafan, fala raja'atani ilayki. O world, I've divorced you thrice. You know how in Islam, if you divorce someone three times, you can't go back to getting married to them again. And so the Imam addresses this life and he says, I've divorced you three times. There's no chance in hell I'm going to come back to you. It's just not going to happen. This is Ali ibn Abi Talib. One day, we mention the story and move on. One day a person walks into the city of Medina from outside. And so he goes to the mosque. When the Imam sees him, uh, excuse me, this is the Kufa, when the Imam was the Khalif. So when the Imam sees him, he says to him, you look like a stranger. Would you like to come to my house and be my guest? Imagine! The Khalifa says to a random stranger, would you like to be my guest? Would you look like you're from out of town? Or would you like to go to any other house owned by any other Muslim? So the guy thinks to himself, obviously I want to go to the Khalifa's residence because that's the White House, that's the governor's mansion. The food there must be much better than any average Muslim. So I'll come with you. So he goes with Amir al -Mumin. When it's time for Amir was the month of Ramadan. So when it's time for Ishtar, the Imam brings whatever was available to him. There was milk and there was bread and there was, you know. And the basics that Amir al and his family would eat. Well, his family, not him. So he puts that in front of the man. And then the Imam goes to a jar made from mud. A jar. But what's interesting about this jar, this man says, he says that the lid was sealed shut and it has the official seal of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Back in the day, the rings were also sealed, right? So you would put mud over it and you would seal it so that if anyone tampered with the lid, you know, because your seal would be broken. So he says the Imam took that jar, he broke the seal off, and he took out a piece of bread which was spoiled rotten. He says, I was sitting next to the Imam and I almost fainted from just the foul stench that came out of that jar. It was a rotten piece of bread. He says, I looked at Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein, I told them, have some mercy on this old man. What is this he's eating? So both the children of Imam Ali told me, 
that he never, he seals the lid of that jar so that we don't tamper with it. We wish we could add some oil so that it would be more edible, they said. But he doesn't let us do that. He has to eat this stuff because he said, what if there is someone out there who's hungry? Allah, Ya 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 What kind of a person this was? Wallahi, brothers and sisters, you know how we're proud that someone acknowledged the letter of Amir al Mu'mineen to Malik al Ashtar of the United Nations. Well, I say this we have failed Ali ibn Abi Talib because the life of Amir al Mu'mineen should be put in book form and given to every single member of Congress. It should be given to every single member of the United States Senate. It should be posted to the White House as a gift. This is our leader. This is Ali ibn Abi Talib. Come get to know him. This is what makes us love him so much to the point that they would kill us, but they cannot extract the love of Ali from our heart. Ask any Shia who's ever been oppressed for being a Shia, and they'll never tell you that, oh, I had to suffer because of Amir al Mu'mineen. They'll always be like, Alhamdulillah. Thank God that we were introduced to the doorstep of Ali ibn Abi Talib. No matter what a price we have to pay, thank God for this blessing. Because we've gotten to know someone who's unequal. Women with the Lord. When Amir al Mu'mineen passed from this world, Imam al Hassan, and this is a big tangent, I don't want to go there. But Imam al Hassan got up and he delivered a sermon. He said to the people that today a man died, that the entire history of humanity has never seen the light of him. And that's a big statement to make because our history, human history, has seen the likes of Adam, Noah, Musa, Isa, He, Yusha. Ibrahim al Khalil. Human history has seen some great people, brothers and sisters. And yet Imam al Hassan said that no one has ever seen the like of Amir al Mu'mineen. And, and the world will never see the like of Ali ibn Abi Talib. The Zuhd of Amir al Mu'mineen is something that we should all inherit, at least, at least partially. The lack of disregard to this world. Brothers and sisters, this life is short. dunya The Prophet says. Just this world is but an hour. So make this hour one that's devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How is it an hour? Think, think back 20 years ago. How does it feel? It went by like an hour. 20 years. Just like that in a snap. The next 20 years will go by the next the same way. And the next 20 years will go by the next way. And at the moment of death, when we're staring death right in the eye, it'll feel like an hour. Now, moving on because we don't have time. The first consequence of being a lover of Ali ibn Abi Talib is asceticism and lack of regard for this world. The second is Brothers and sisters, the Prophet here is telling us that if you truly love the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, you will exert greater effort in this life. You will seek example from the life of Amir al Mu'mineen who never wasted a single moment. Isn't it pathetic that we live in an age where society and culture is always encouraging us to waste our time? Whether it be with video games or fidget spins, whether it be with hanging out with our friends, doing absolutely nothing but wasting time, or speaking to people online and on social media, whether it be Snapchatting and doing things that are really useless, or just spending our times in our bed sleeping or just staring at the roof, this 
world is short, as I said earlier, brothers and sisters. It passes too quickly for, for me to waste my time, to waste my life. If you're going to do something, then do something that's worthwhile. You and I and all of us, we're like a candle that's burning every second that passes. We're melting, we're burning, we're getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And there's nothing you can do to reverse the process, by the way. As much as Sergey Brin and the founders of Google would want to, there's nothing you can do about death. You cannot avert death. It's the only inevitability in life. It's the only certainty in life. So if we're, if we're going to die anyway, if we're melting away any second anyway, if we're getting smaller and shorter and weaker by the second, then we might as well spend that time in something that's constructive. Don't waste your life. Believe me, I'm addressing the youth. Believe me that in 10, 15, 20 years' time, when you get older and you have a family of your own, inshallah, you'll have kids of your own, you'll have responsibilities, you'll have a house, you'll have an income to earn, you'll have all of these distractions, and it's at that moment that you'll say to yourself, I wish I had invested my time better when I was younger and didn't have to deal with all these things. I wish I had invested in myself and my knowledge. I wish I had spent time memorizing the sermon of Fadakiya of Fatima to Zahra, memorizing the sermon of Shachiqi of Ali ibn Abi Talib, instead of wasting my life on video games. What do you get out of a video game? Not even a momentary joy. Nothing, nothing. Five seconds after you throw that tablet or you throw that video, video game console, you have nothing left. Don't waste your time. And Hirsu al Amal, the Prophet says, being eager to produce, being eager to making yourself better and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Moving on, number three, the third consequence of loving Ali and Abi Talib is that you guard yourself against sin, is that you guard yourself against the evils of this world. Let me mention a beautiful hadith which is actually the first hadith in my book which I wrote about the teachings of Prophet Jesus السلام, the Lost Testament the first one says that one day Jesus the son of Mary saw the world, the dunya epitomized in an ugly, creepy, old, toothless woman it's a beautiful parable so Jesus saw the world epitomized and embodied in this old, creepy, toothless woman. So, but what's interesting is that the Hadith says this woman, she herself was totally creepy, but she had adorned herself with every beauty that you can imagine. There's gold, there's silver, there's glitter, there's glamour. So she's ugly, she's hideous, but she's covered up with things that are beautiful, which is a very beautiful description of the world that we live in today. So then he told her, how many people have you married? In other words, how many people have been deceived by you? You're a creepy old woman, but you're, uh, you've adorned yourself. Surely people have been deceived by you. How many people have you married? She says, Kafi, many big people have married me. You'd be surprised how many people fell from my deceptions. So then he asked her, what happened to them? Did they all divorce you? Did they come to their senses when they realized who you are? Or did they just pass away? She said, I've killed each and every one of them. I've destroyed them all. Then Isa says, Boksun, misery belongs to your present husband's who do not heed the lessons of your previous husbands. Imagine if there was a woman, like a yeah, in this culture they call them um, gold diggers, right? Imagine if there was this woman who had been remarried ten times, and each time she got married to someone, that person ended up getting, getting killed mysteriously. You'd think that the eleventh guy who wants to marry this woman would know better than to marry her, right? would think twice, that at some point it would register, that it can't be possible for ten husbands to die under mysterious circumstances, 
and I'm going to survive, and I'm going to make it out in one piece. Isa says, miserable are your present husbands who do not take a lesson from your previous husbands, that you keep killing one after the other. And so, al-wara'u of deen is not worth your life. Amir al mumin has a beautiful hadith. He says, لَيْسَ اِعْلَمُوا أَنَّهُ لَيْسَ لِأَبْدَانِكُمْ هَذِهِ ثَمَنٌ إِلَّا الْجَنَّةِ You should know that your life has only one worth. There's only one thing that's worth you, your body, your life, and that's paradise. Anything under that, and you're a loser. Number four, the Prophet says, الْرَقْبَةُ فِي الْعِبَادَةِ The other consequence of loving Ali ibn Abi Talib is that you develop a love for acts of worship, whether it be prayer, whether it be hajj, whether it be ziyarah to the holy shrines of the Ahlul Bayt, these are all acts of worship. Whether it be fasting, it's recommended to fast the beginning of each month, even obviously outside of the month of Ramadan, any other month, it's recommended to fast the first day, the middle of the month, and the last day of the month. So three days per month of fasting. You see people who do that oftentimes, and it's like, it's like not, it's not even a burden anymore. It's something they enjoy. Enjoying the worshiping of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a byproduct of loving Ali ibn Abi Talib. That's why you'll see the companions of Amir al mumini people like Uwais al Ghani. I don't know how much you're familiar with Uwais Uwais al Ghani, but he's an incredible personality. He needs an entire lecture dedicated to him. But he's the man who never saw the Prophet in his life. And yet the Prophet said that I can smell the odor of paradise coming from Yemen because that's where Uwais al Ghani came from. The Prophet promised to waste paradise even though he never actually met him. Why did he never meet him? Because Uwais had an elderly mother that he cared for. And his mother told him that if he were to leave Yemen and go to Medina to meet the Prophet, I'm afraid that I will miss you. So I want you to stay with me. Allah Akbar. Sometimes you can reach that high level by looking after your mother. Again, I'm talking to the younger members of the audience. Caring for your mother. Looking after what she likes you to do. Even if she drops a hint, she doesn't actually have to order you to do something. A mere hint should be enough for you to say, Mom, I will do as you ask. Mothers love their children, brothers and sisters. And of course, tonight we're commemorating the passing of a wonderful woman who is also a compassionate mother. Don't wait, God forbid, until you met your mothers pass before you begin to appreciate them. Appreciate them while they're there. Inshallah. So Uwais al why was he so great? Because number one, he looked after his ill mother. Number two, listen to this, Uwais would spend his nights in prayer. A hundred raka'at. Some people do a hundred raka'at on the third night of Qadr. May Allah bless you if you do that. However, there were people whose love towards the Ahlul is so strong that they would pray a hundred raka'at every single night. Every single night. Not only that, sometimes always would gather his friends. And that's, that's another wonderful trait you can have. Is if you do something good, get your friends involved. Get your relatives or your cousins. Get them involved. Encourage them. So always would bring his friends together and he'd say, Tonight, let's pray a hundred raka'at. And they'll pray. The next night he would say, Well, let's spice things up a bit. Tonight, Let's spend the entire night in prostrating before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine that. What's even harder than that? He would get, gather his friends and say, Tonight we'll do ruku'ah before Allah. Try to do that for five minutes, minutes and you'll know what I'm talking about. He would spend the entire night in ruku'ah. Moving on. The fifth trait the Prophet says, at tawbah to qablin to ask God for repent, for forgiveness, to repent to Him before we die. Brothers and sisters, one of the ulama says, I was in the shrine of Amir al mumineen when I saw three maraja enter the shrine all at the same time. Or maybe at different times, but they were there together at the same time. Ayatullah al-Ghumma, Shahbudi, Ayatullah al-Ghumma, Khoi, Ayatullah al-Ghumma, 
a king perhaps, three grand religious leaders were all together in the shrine of Amir al A smart person isn't one who goes up to them and takes selfies. A smart person is the one who goes up to each one of them and asks a question. So he says, I went up to these three Maraja, one at a time. And I asked them to give me, to teach me what the best dua is while here in the shrine of Amir al -Mu'mini. What's the best thing to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He says, amazingly, they all gave me the same consistent answer. They all said, Husna aqabat. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when you place your cheek on the dirt in your grave, that you have done so with the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib and belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still intact in your heart. That something doesn't go wrong at the 11th hour before we die and we abandon belief because that, brothers and sisters, is the time when Shaytan puts all his game into trying to deceive you, into trying to push you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shaytan who has dedicated his entire life to deceiving you at that moment because he knows this is the last chance he has, he will do everything in his power. Whether it be something that you really love, we have a lot of um, traditions that suggest that Shaitan will use the things that you hold dearest to your heart and will come to you at the moment of death and say, you worship me or I will destroy this. Whatever that may be. So never be attached to anything. You buy that slick new smartphone, fine. Don't be too attached to it. You buy a big, shiny, brand new car, don't be too attached to it. A car is a car. It's supposed to take it from point A to point B. Don't get too attached that if God forbid someone leaves a scratch on it, it's like the end of the world. It's not. Don't be too attached. And by the way, just as an extra tip, one of the ways to decrease attachment to this world is to give zakat. And zakat includes khums, it includes charity, it includes the zakat of your money. To give it away of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala weakens those attachments. And we need the attachments to be weak point of death. What Tawbata Qabla al the Prophet says. And the way you can ensure that before you die you have repented is that you continuously repent while you're alive. Right now. To say Ilahi Al-Af, Al-Af, Al-Af in Salatul Layl is one way to ensure that when the moment comes for you to close your eyes forever that you also say Ilahi Al-Af, Ilahi Bi'ami Al-Mu'mini Al-Fari and number six, the Prophet says, and to be excited to wake up at night to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you love Ali and Abi Talib, you find that excitement. You know, let me give you this example very briefly. Imagine if you were told that tomorrow you have a meeting, a private, one-on-one -on -one audience with the president, or with someone you really admire, or with a manager, right? Could you sleep through that appointment? You couldn't, could you? In fact, you probably can't even sleep the night waiting for that big meeting that you're going to have. Am I right? No. Those people who love Ali and through Ali love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they can't wait to get up at night and pray Salat al By the way, if you say that Salat al is difficult, it's long, it takes a while, then here's another thing you can do. You can merely pray Salat al or Salat al -Mut. So two rak'at and then one singular rak'at, and you can consider that to be Salat al -Mut. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that generous, He's that merciful. If you can't get yourself to get up and pray Salat al you can do so while lying in your own bed. Shawq. You have to have it. If you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you want to speak to Him. Especially when it's night time, everybody's asleep. And in the solitary of your own being, you get up and you speak to God. God speaks to you. There is a kind of light for the face. There's a kind of attraction that only those people have who wake up and worship Allah at night. Anyway, a lot to discuss but not enough time. Number seven, al yaksu min ma fi aydin nas. To give up on all the things that other people have. Amir al Mubarin says, he says, ihtaj ila min shit takun asiyah. 
need anybody and you will be their captive, you will be their slave. When you go up to someone and you ask them for a favor, you're humiliating yourself. Yes, it might be a humiliation that you think is worth it. Yes, it might be something that's necessary. But at the end of the day, you are being a captive to that person. He or she will always think that they have done a favor and will expect the favor to, return, to be returned at some point. Have complete disregard in what other people have. If you can ensure that you have a direct line of connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and never need anybody in your life, then do so, the hadith says. If, if you can earn your own living without ever extending your hand before other people, then do so. And yes, don't even look at what other people have. Somebody bought a shiny new car, fine, good for them. If they're good people, good for them. If they're bad people, bad for them. Somebody bought a big new house, who cares? Don't even look at what they have. Look at what you have. Remember so Remember not having any regard to this world. Be content with what you have. Say Alhamdulillah for all the health He's given you, the family, the children. These are blessings that we can never be thankful to Allah for. We can never be grateful enough to Him. Focus on what you have and not on what you don't have. Number eight, Alhamdulillah 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 when you love Ali ibn Abi Talib, to you it will matter if God is pleased with this or not pleased with that. I'll move on. Number 10, the Prophet says, As-Sakhaw, to be generous. If you truly love Amir al muminin you'll be generous. You will see the money in your position as a trust given to you by Allah. You're just a bookkeeper. You're just a bank cashier. That's all you are. It's difficult. I know it's difficult because most of us think, no, this is my hard-earned money, I work hard to get this. But until you see yourself as nothing but a bank teller and a cashier who is in possession of this money as a trust and needs to give it to whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give him to, until that happens, then there's something missing. Then your love to Amir al is not complete. One day a group of people came to Imam Sadiq if I'm not mistaken. And they said, hey, Ya'ani we are from Khurasan. We know Bani Umayya are oppressive. We know these rulers must be overthrown. And here we are declaring our allegiance to you. We're more than happy to lay our lives at your command, whatever you say. The Imam said to them, when it comes to your money, do you also, are you also happy to lay it at my command? Are you also happy to part with your wealth? If I told you now to give all of your money to the poor, would you give it all away? Or no? So they said to me, Imam, well, yeah, 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 no, so no, no. Our money is our money at the end of the day. I'll pay the homes and I'll pay this God. But, but the rest of it is mine, truly, surely, right? The Imam said, well, if your money is your money, then your lives are your lives as well. You can keep I don't know. You have to have the kind of obedience where the money that you have, the wealth that you have, the possessions, everything that's in, 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 uh, uh, under your title and under your name, it belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you see it that way, then if you lose it, you won't really care because it wasn't yours to begin with, number one. If you see it that way, then you will never use it in haram because you think of this car as God's car, this house as God's house, this money as God's money. You're not going to use it in a way that is, that is sinful or that, it, that transgresses the, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you see it that way, when someone poor comes along, someone needy comes along, you will gladly share it with them because again, it's not yours to begin with. It's not yours to begin with. I know a wealthy businessman I personally met him several times who's like that. He always says that whatever I have is not even mine to begin with. It's not mine. It belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So wherever God wants me to put it, I'll put it right there. I'm like a bank teller. Have you ever seen a bank teller hesitating when they give you the money? They don't care because it's not theirs, right? That's how you should see your own wealth. As sahab, to give it the way of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala as a sign that you love Ali ibn Abi Talib because 
Ali ibn Abi Talib. His sahab was legendary. It was exemplary. How so? In the middle of the battlefield, he comes across an enemy combatant. The Imam lifts his sword, the same sword that never came down except by sending the opponent straight to the bottom of hell. And that guy knew so. He knew Ali, he knew, he knew the fiqah. As soon as he saw this, he said, Ya Ali, Atali, say that. Oh, Ali, give me your sword. And they were going through the sword. The guy was shocked, he didn't expect it. He took the sword. He hung it on what happened. You gave it to me? So the Imam said, I've never refused anyone to request for help. And I'm not going to start now. You ask me for the sword. Here, take the sword. He threw himself to the feet of Amir al Mu'mini. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad al Rasulullah. Wa ashhadu anna Ali al Muhammad. Towards the end of his life, again, brothers and sisters, I remind myself and I remind you. Imam al-Sadiq says, Ayyuh al-Shabaab, Ya Ma'ashar al-Shabaab. He's speaking to the youth. He says, we have seen people who try to gain the akhirah, the hereafter, and in doing so, they gain both this world as well as the hereafter. But we've never seen anyone who tries to gain this dunya and also gains the akhirah. It never works that way. But if you work for your hereafter, if you work for your afterlife, if you work for Jannah, Allah will also give you a package deal. You'll also get this world as a bonus if you like. This is why towards the end of his life, Amir al-Mu'mini looks up, he says, As-salamu alaykum ya malaikata rabbi. What's going to happen to me at the moment of my death? Whose face shall I see? Will I be able to see the face of Ali ibn Abi Talib? Amir al Mu'mini looks up, Assalamu alaykum ya malaikata rabbi. And then he said, Lilithlihada fali'amal al-amilun. If you're going to work and spend your life doing something in this world, then you might as well do so for this. And what Amir al Mu'mini was witnessing was the eternal bliss of paradise. It was a life free of pain, a life free of misery, a life free of torture, and all the things that he had to endure in this life. Oh, Thank you. 